better. Um, so good morning again, everyone. It's nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Dr. Christy Cook. If you don't know me, this is my second year teaching at Weatherford College, and I'm so delighted to be presenting today with a colleague and a dear friend, Ms. Pam Rollins, uh, who is an instructor at Southwestern Oklahoma State University. And the way she's able to do that is she is an online instructor full-time for Southwestern Oklahoma State University. So um, she and I have both been teaching for several years, both been teaching online and face-to-face -face, um, since 2011. So today we're going to share some of the things that we've learned from that process. We're gonna give a brief overview of how memes and other visual assignments can be used in academic settings. So, one second, we'll talk about how we read online, how we look at memes and infographics in particular. We're gonna consider some top tips and some other applications of both of those. And then there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. Um, if any questions occur to you, any comments, we would love to hear them as we go. If you wanna type them in the chat window, we might not read them as they come in, but at the end, we absolutely will. So we would love to hear from all of you. Ms. Rollins is going to ask you a burning question. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Cook. Yes, yeah, so this question is something I think as instructors, many of us have asked for the students in our audience, you may have been asked this by your professor, didn't they read the instructions? Um, feel free to give us a reaction or respond in the chat if you've ever heard that question or asked it of yourself or your students. Uh, I think it's a, a common problem or issue that I know I've experienced, Dr. Cook has experienced, where we receive a question and we wonder, didn't they read the instructions? We receive assignment submissions. And I've even found myself saying, as noted in the instructions, you should blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and Ms. Rollins Scott just shared also, as noted in the syllabus, how many times have we said that, right? Yes, exactly. And so that question really led me and Dr. Cook in, in our conversations about this problem of what can we do about that? Um, so I did a little investigating just in terms of to try to understand what's happening. What are people doing when they are reading? And that research was really interesting. Um, through some eye tracking studies, uh, what it revealed was that 80% of users will only skim the page. And then when users actually read the page, they're only reading about 20% of the text. And this particular study was done of highly intelligent users. So <laughs> keep that in mind as well. What that means if we put it in context of pedagogy and assignment instructions, is that for about a thousand words on a page, users are reading about 200 of them. So I guess we have to hope they're reading the right ones. <laughs> um, but to break that down just a little further, as you'll see in the graph, it was interesting when I noticed that pages that only had 100 words, users would read about 50%. So yes, there are fewer words, but they're actually reading more of them. Um, so that's a pretty shocking number and something that really inspired this presentation and this transfer of information. And Dr. So, I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about some different strategies that we've used to try to approach reading and presenting information online. Right, so what Ms. Rollins just shared with us really is scary, I think. It's startling, a bit shocking, and um, scary on the one hand, but then on the other hand, when I think about myself reading online, I do the same thing, right? So this, this is the reality. The reality is when we're reading online, we do skim, and that's what happens and or when we're reading any written material, like someone shared in the chat, it was bulleted, numbered, and absolutely. So we as instructors, we outline really carefully and do such a good job. But then when I think about myself as a reader, as a user, especially a, a web user, it's the same thing. We're just not going to read it all. We're simply not going to. 
So what do we do then? How do we, how do we combat that? Well, one of my answers is let's use something we're already using. We're all immersed and enmeshed in memes already. Memes are such a major part of probably everyone's lives, everyone who's, who's with us today, um, definitely our students' lives. So since we're immersed in visual, digital media, let's use that to our advantage in the classroom. Memes and GIFs have been around a long time, but particularly since the pandemic, their usage has spiked, their transmission numbers have spiked because it's a way for us to stay connected, is to share these jokes, to share in this, this way of expressing our reflections on our reality. So let's use that in the classroom, I would say. I would say and I do say, I shall say. <laughs> So um, as I mentioned, memes and GIFs, they're really more than just kind of a superficial laugh. I really enjoy this quote, uh, memes and GIFs are more than just a way to pass the time while we wait in line. They often offer sharp political and social commentary that functions as a coping mechanism for living in absurd modern times. So I would say when we're thinking about digital pedagogy, give it a try. Um, consider adding a meme or a GIF into maybe just one classroom activity, just once. And if it goes well, build on that. Here are some ideas. You can use them as an icebreaker, kind of have something projected as students are walking in and have them start with that. This could be a first day of class icebreaker. Um, you could have a meme about how awkward first days are or how awkward meetings are. Um, you can use memes and GIFs to explore society and culture. For example, um, there's, there's a whole field of study around the way that so many of our reactions in memes um, are images of black um, men and women. And so then that's actually, there's a term for that that many of you might be aware of already, digital blackface. So the, the fact that we're, this is happening in our society, that's something in our society and culture that could be examined critically, a critical lens to talk about race through a meme. Um, we can use memes to demonstrate course concepts, certainly. Um, so this is what instructors can do with memes and GIFs. So there's that side of it. But then what can we, uh, what we can do, what we can provide, but how can we have students and for our students in the audience, um, how might you want to use memes and GIFs in your instruction? So an opportunity would be to have students generate them. Um, there are so many apps to make memes. A few of them are meme creator, meme generator, quick meme. Chances are your students already have favorite meme generating apps on their phones. Um, they can also be accessed on the web very, very easily. Um, you can use memes and GIFs to learn new vocabulary. Um, to, you can have students create them to show that they know the vocabulary, have students create them to dramatize key points from a novel if you're in the English field or from a time period for our history folks, um, or really whatever discipline specific reading that you give, you can have students interpret in a meme or a GIF. Um, so they can read these discipline specific articles and they can identify key points, and then they can create an infographic, which we'll talk a bit more about in just a moment. Um, if your students interact with the public, if you're in the medical sciences, health sciences field, or um, any of our other programs where students will be interacting directly with the public, have students create infographics to share information um, that like about how to detect a stroke, how to, you know, whatever it is that's important in your field. Um, if there's an infographic, then they're much more likely to understand, um, much more likely to retain the information. So then students are considering things like, how will the chosen words complement the images? What's the best way to explain and display the information? And um, how can I make this information persuasive? How can I persuade my audience that they should get the COVID-19 vaccine? How can I make an infographic to communicate that to the audience? Absolutely. So Ms. Rollins is going to tell us a bit more about how, how, how can we do that? So we know why, so how? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Cook. And it's really interesting too, to look at like the combination of images and text and how that combination really becomes an effective way to transfer knowledge. Um, there's been a lot of marketing research on the combination of images and text. 
Um, and that has shown um, that, for example, uh, tweets that have an image consistently get more views, significantly more views. When we can combine images and text, we can, at the, at the very least, get more engagement um, and then our user becomes more motivated because then they're interested. We've caught their attention and they will continue to participate and read. Um, providing information also in a visual format uh, allows our cognitive load um, to be decreased and we can process information more efficiently. Um, and then all of these things kind of lead to what we want, a better comprehension um, and more effective performance. So in looking um, at memes, but also as Dr. Cook explained, memes are a great way to communicate information quickly and efficiently. Infographics are also useful. They may be um, used in terms of maybe something that's a little more in depth than assignment or information that you want to communicate, but you need maybe more than just a line or two of text. Um, and that's where infographics comes in. Um, it allows the either the, the student as the reader or the instructor as the one transferring the information to give students an alternative way to learn. I mean, it's no secret that a large majority of our learners are visual learners uh, and this provides us another opportunity to present information um, and as Dr. Cook said this is a great way for example students to present their research their information break down an assignment and that's given to them in text and then transfer that perhaps into an infographic format um, present their own research create a poster these are you know effective tools um, in learning and in teaching <clears throat> One thing that we do want to communicate, though, is we learners, not everyone is a visual learner. So this is just one way that we approach learning and teaching, and we want to continue to provide those text uh, instructions. I know I, I will be the one who, re who reads the terms and conditions. I will be the one who will go in and break down the written instructions piece by piece. So keep that in mind too. This is just one way. It's most certainly not the only way. Um, it just allows us to provide um, our learners and our audiences of information in a variety of formats. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, about how to reach our audience in the most effective way because no matter um, whether we're presenting that information with text only or images, if it's not designed appropriately for the, for the user, it's not effective. Uh, so it can be, it can be beautiful, <laughs> but if, it ha if there's no thought process organization, our user is going to become overwhelmed and put it away. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to share with you one of many web reading patterns. There are a lot, but it, the F pattern is one of those. And Dr. Cook is going to talk about some other uh, approaches to reading and translating web information. But for the F pattern, the way this layout works is that users tend to start in this top corner where you see the number one, um, and then they will move across the page. Then they will move back to number one and down and across the page again. And from there, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of a back and forth because of the scrolling feature. But in general, the F pattern allows, um, tends to be the, one of the most common ways um, that users will read um, and organize information on the web. Digital information is read differently. Digital information is constructed differently. So we want to think about when we're producing an infographic, for example, we want to keep that in mind. So as Ms. Rollins mentioned, when um, people are encountering text on the web, they might often, they will uh, move in an F pattern. So another item that we want to consider when we're creating in in infographics or when we're instructing students on how to create effective infographics is how do we read them? How does one read an infographic? So here is one 
um, way that we can consider teaching or consider approaching an infographic. And then I'll share one other as well. It's not necessarily an either or. Um, and then there are, as Ms. Rollins mentioned, numerous ways to approach this. So find something that works for you. If it sticks, if it works for you, keep it. If it doesn't, let it go. Um, so one option on how to read an infographic that I appreciate because it's very specific to my discipline um, is the rhetorical triangle. So an infographic, a meme, just like a book, just like an article is a text. These of course are all text. So we can think about analyzing them with the rhetorical triangle in mind, considering what is the purpose of this infographic? Who is the author of this infographic? Who created this information? Are they credible? Where does it come from? And what audience is this infographic targeting? Um, so this helps us then take a look at the message, the text in the middle, um, and ask ourselves, what needs to happen to this text because of audience purpose and um, author, if the author is self or if someone else has created it. What techniques are used to make it credible? What's omitted? That's a really valuable question to ask when approaching an infographic. What is not in that infographic? What do we not know that maybe we would like to know to have a more complete picture? Um, the same media lit literacy techniques that many of us already teach can be applied to infographics. Um, so we wanna start maybe with identifying the central theme. What is the point? What is the claim? What's the central idea of this infographic? And then we go to the middle, the message. Well, we're in the middle in the message, but we think about also, in addition to the theme as the message, we think about visual elements. That's of course key with infographics, things like color, font, spacing, the rule of thirds, which states, I'm not an expert, but it states that if one has um, a photograph, for example, if you think of it divided into quadrants, both horizontally and vertically, and then you wanna think about those intersection points as where your key information is, because that draws the eye. Um, so many ways to think about how the eye is drawn. And I am not a graphic designer or an expert in this, nor does any of us have to be, because we can just kind of give it a try and start where we are and build on that. So in addition to thinking about the rhetorical triangle as one way to approach an infographic, another way we could teach our students or for our students in the audience, another way that might be helpful to approach an infographic or any visual um, digital media that one encounters is the SCD strategy. This is not my strategy. I am just sharing it with you today. Um, so the SCD strategy, S stands for structure, C for content, and D for design. Kind of nice to have an acronym to hook into sometimes. Um, so regarding structure, infographics, of course, have a structure, just like any other text that we read. So the information presented is connected. It's not just a bunch of random stuff thrown at us. So we want to ask ourselves, how is it organized? Um, is there a chronological organization? Is there a cause and effect organization structure? Is it an inductive, deductive organizational structure? Um, so if we can identify how it's organized, then that helps us read it effectively. Sometimes um, infographics can be a little bit overwhelming. And so sometimes starting with the structure, how is this put together? helps us know what to do with it. Um, another thing we can think about with organization is, is the information organized by person, by event, by product? Ask ourselves, does the author use data? Does the author use statistics to organize information? If there are numbers in an infographic or a meme, readers will latch on to those numbers. And we wanna know that as instructors, because we want to know that whether or not those numbers are valid, reliable, current, credible, people are latching onto them and repeating them. So that's something we really wanna focus on. If data is used um, to organize this information, we want to examine how, how that data is presented, where that data comes from, if it's presented in a misleading way. Um, and these are, these are critical reading and critical thinking strategies that we can teach as instructors or that we can learn as students. When we, so that was regarding structure. So one way to, one way to start, one place to start with an infographic is ask ourselves about the structure. Then we can think about the content. What's the actual content of this infographic? What story is being communicated? What's the main claim that the author is presenting and what evidence is used to support it? 
What's the source of information? Um, is it credible and current? I'm mentioning that often, <laughs> that's very important. I, I know all of you know that. Um, actually only 53% roughly of infographics contain data and numbers, but as I said, people latch onto them. So take a look, keep an eye out for misleading statistics. Look for important words, um, look for important phrases, look for repetition when you're thinking about content and analyzing the content of an infographic. Identify the parts and take a look at how they relate to the whole. And then finally, we want to think about the design of an infographic uh, because, of course, thought was put into how this was designed. Some simple design principles to be aware of are typography. How is ty typography used? Italics, bolding, font choice. What about colors? How are colors used? What information is emphasized through the use of specific colors? Do the colors relate to the content or the topic? Spacing, alignment, white space. How are they used intentionally to focus our cueing, the reader's visual cueing system? Thinking about the F pattern or the rule of thirds. Um, how are those being implemented to draw our eye? And then finally, icons, numbers, images, adding to the overall understanding of the message and highlighting important information. What do we notice when we think about that design element? So one way, the SCD strategy, structure, content, design, help us think about how to read and interpret, analyze infographics. When we're thinking about that, of course, building off of design, we might wanna ask ourselves, okay, now, how can we design effective infographics? We wanna be able to read and interpret infographics so that we're not just mindlessly kind of absorbing the information. So now transitioning to designing our own impactful and effective infographics, we want to turn to Ms. Rollins who has some information to share about effective design. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Yes, these are just, we're gonna go through some like, practical application of whether you're an instructor who is creating an infographic or you're a student who um, maybe has been giving this as an assignment um, or you just wanna do it for fun. <laughs> uh, one of the key things to understand with infographics is they tend to present information in blocks and each of those blocks um, has a purpose. We start with the header and the header tends to be pretty basic. That's essentially your title. Um, to grab the reader's attention. You don't want it to be um, too messy, to keep it pretty simple. And that's something I know Dr. Cook emphasized is that do not have to be a, a web designer. Um, the, the software, which we will talk about um, in a little bit that, that we've used for this presentation and for infographics and memes um, is user-friendly and it is created for, for everyone. So, um, Back to the, the information in terms of chunking, we have our header. The body is obviously gonna be, you know, even as we do in written text, this is gonna be the meat of the presentation. So you'll find that the body can be um, a bit longer. And because this is designed for web users, it, you know, having to scroll um, is, is typical of that. Um, this is where you really wanna be careful about limiting the amount of text and using images uh, in an effective way. You'll note here, there is a little amount of text and some basic uh, images and icons. It does not have to be um, complicated and really an infographic is designed to be very simple um, so that you can communicate that information um, as quickly and efficiently as possible. The footer is typically used to either source information. Um, it can also connect to a wider issue. I think for when I'm doing an assignment instruction, for example, I typically use the footer to contextualize what this, where, what students can do with this information. Here's how this assignment fits within either the progression of other assignments in the course or the progression of concepts within the lesson. So keep that in mind with chunking. Um, and then just looking at actual design, here I have, I think it's always good to, um, I've known for 
always using myself as a bad example, I, you know, lessons learned. So here's one of the first infographics um, I ever produced. And I will say it's not terrible, but you know, we're, it's a learning process. So I like to use this as what not to do here. Um, some, keep it simple. So you want to avoid too much information. This here, probably I would say the first mistake is there's not a clear reading pattern. Um, it, the F pattern somehow goes up. That's not really an F pattern. And then you go down. It's close, but it's not quite there. It needs to be organized a little more efficiently. Font styles. Keep it simple. Again, two to three font styles is really all, all you need. Um, work within those and be consistent. Consistency is, is key um, when designing this. You don't have to be fancy. And in fact, you shouldn't be fancy. Don't be fancy. Just Keep it simple, keep your font styles limited. It helps the readers identify and organize information. And then the same with colors. And that's probably the largest mistake on this particular example here is there are too many colors. You wanna keep it to three to five colors and they need to be complementary and contrasting at the same time. Luckily, um, because it can get complicated sometimes when we're trying to pick colors, a lot of the software already has palettes that uh, coordinate well together. Um, you'll, and we'll talk about that again in, in a little bit uh, in terms of templates and things like that. So use the tools that are available because they will help you stay within that color pattern. In this particular example, I've got red, pink, light blue, dark blue, green, and it's just a little, a little too much. Again, it's not the worst, but it's also not the best. And so, um, the reader can get confused or maybe won't, won't even read 20% of this. And it's, we want to make sure that we're trying to present the information as effectively as, as we can. So some top tips uh, that I've learned, again, from my own uh, <laughs> learning process and mistakes. Um, when you are creating infographics and you're planning to share this with a wide audience, um, particularly for instructors, if this is for assignment instructions, don't over customize it like by putting, for example, the, the semester that it's in, because then you'll find you'll have to go back in and change that every single semester. So try to keep it simple. You don't have to date the material. Um, and that's just a, a practical time saving tip that I learned myself too, because, you know, the templates do change time and I will edit things as needed, but if I can limit that, um, I certainly do. I mentioned templates before and, and I will encourage you to use templates. Uh, they are designed by actual designers. <laughs> and so use the tools available to you as instructors and students, our time is so um, limited and we all have so many things going on that it does take time to work within even the beginner programs. So use the templates. They typically have a lot of these top tips already uh, set up for you and for your success. Um, I will tend to find a template um, and then just rework it for what I need. And that's the nice thing. The templates aren't uh, static. You can make adjustments, remove things, add things. And oftentimes they'll just give me the inspiration that I need, even if I want to start with a blank page a slide or two, I can do that. And we're going to transition. So, yes, um, even with all of the thought that we put in, all of the thought that Ms. Rollins just shared, and then so much more that we put in on our end, instructions will still be unclear for some. And that's OK. Um, we're not going to reach everyone, even with the most perfect and beautiful infographic that has ever been designed. Um, and we all know this experience from designing um, other types of materials as well. And that's okay. Instructions will still be unclear. That's okay. Don't take that personally. It happens. We all know that happens. Um, we wanted to share with you, uh, as we've mentioned several times, uh, you do not have to be a graphic designer. You don't have to have a, ba a background in IT. Um, I have neither, Ms. Rollins has neither. These programs are designed for beginners. This particular 
presentation was put together in Canva. So we'd like to share with you two design tools that we can give our stamp of approval to, but again, emphasize there are so many and there are so many fantastic ones. Um, so Canva is fantastic. You can see the template that we chose, um, the oranges and the blues and the blacks that work together and then template that we chose. And then there's also Pictachart that we um, are fans of and have used Canva for presentations primarily, although it also is good for infographics and then Pictochart primarily for infographics, although it is also fine for presentations. Um, and again, there are so many more that we'd be happy to share with you as well, but we wanted to leave you with some free design tools that you, if you wanted to, could play around with for just a few minutes um, and, and start to really feel fairly comfortable with. So now we would really like to open up. We wanna make sure that we have a conversation. Um, we'd love to answer any questions if people have questions, but if you just like to share, we would love to hear from you also. Welcome to share in the chat window, or um, I believe, and Ms. Rollins will have to help me out with this one. Um, I believe that you can unmute yourself and just chat as well. So taking a peek at the chat window, give that a little bit of time. And then does anyone have anything they'd like to share, comment or question? Um, Scott said he's had so many people talk about Canva, but he's never tried it. Have to get going there at some point. Scott, I think that you'll like it. I know that you are very, very tech savvy. So I think um, that you will just, it would come very easily to you. I am not very, very tech savvy. I am like, moderately trying um, and I, I was able to use Canva pretty effectively with a little bit of, of guidance. So I think you would enjoy adding that one to your repertoire. And the nice thing <laughs> is a lot of these, um, there are a lot of YouTube videos that Canva and Pictochart have created. They have a great section of help guides and tutorials to get you started if it's something you're completely new to or you're, it, it, it seems overwhelming, that's where I would start would be try to go through some of the tutorials and just watch that process. They are, um, I have found great in terms of support. Absolutely. And Scott, you're absolutely right now to find the time. I hear that. <laughs> um, Megan has a question and um, I would love to take that. And then we have another question in the chat that we'll come to, Megan. Uh, I was just wondering, are, will we be able to rewatch this? I was a little late getting up to the hospital and getting set up <laughs> over here. Yeah, yeah, thanks for asking. And I think that's the same question that just that came into the chat. Um, we are recording these and we're recording them to the cloud. Um, Scott or maybe someone else who's here can speak a little more definitively as to what's going to happen to that. But my understanding is that it's being recorded to be made available. Um, I don't know, again, exactly when, where, and how that happens if anyone does know, I would love for you to share, but that's my understanding. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to ask or share? I just lost my uh, chat window. Sorry, I'm, I really wish I were on my computer instead of my phone. I think we do have technology. one question here um, in the chat. How would you use infographs for students who aren't visual learners in such a way that they have a better understanding of the information? What do you think, Ms. Rollins? Uh, well, I think that's a, one of a, a great question in terms of how we would approach that. And one of the things that I do if I'm going to give infographs in terms of an assignment to students, I like to give a, a choice so that our students who maybe don't adapt to visual learning don't, it doesn't work for them, giving them a students like three options to, to do this assignment, you can create an e-portfolio, you can create an infographic, or you can present a poster or a PowerPoint. That's just, you know, one example. So that if they're not visual learners in, in that way, that they have another option um, that might appeal to them in the way that they learn. In terms, if I'm just trying to present an infographic to transfer knowledge or information, 
Um, kind of going back to what we mentioned earlier, this is just one way we, we provide that information. So I still absolutely have my 1000 word assignment instructions like Scott's that are bulleted and numbered and have all of that information in writing. And then I often, and I know Dr. Cook does this too, you know, we present to our students and speak to our students via Zoom. So I might offer um, breakout sessions or um, rooms where we can talk and, and have a, I call them, you know, frequently asked question Zooms and I'll set up a time and just say, hey, drop in within this hour and bring a question about the assignment. We'll talk about it. Um, and go through it that way. And that way we're, you know, we're reaching those learners on a variety of different level, levels. Absolutely. And just a, a quick addition to that, I love the point about giving students options. So for students who are like infographic, absolutely not. I don't even, I don't care. I don't understand. I don't want to try it. Um, there's uh, something we used to use when I taught high school, the kind of tic-tac-toe assignment. Um, distribution thing. So you can just have a tic-tac-toe board and each one of those squares is a different option that a student could pick. And you can have it so they have to pick, you know, two or one or, you know, whatever works for your purposes to whatever kind of level you're, you're putting on there. If it's, whether it's small assignments or larger assignments, larger assignments, they would just choose one. Um, but then your students who want to say, hey, you know, I've heard of Canva, but I never had the time to give it a try. I will use this as my opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and get in there and then it counts for something. Uh, we had a question about where's the best place to find memes from Laura. Thanks, Laura. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, I can I can share where I find them. Ms. Rollins can share where she finds them and then anyone else who has uh, ideas, we'd love to hear from you too. What do you think, Ms. Rollins? Um, you know, with I typically will... And that's a good question too, in terms of, am I, we need to think about, do, are we allowed to use that image? So I typically um, will start somewhere where I try to create them myself. And there are some tools like Pixabay uh, that allow users to use images for free or with, um, as long as they're credited. Um, and it, it provides that release information on there. So usually Pixabay is where I would start. Um, and then kind of go from there. I know Dr. Cook, you probably have some other suggestions for in terms of like pop culture images or. Right, and I was just thinking, this is this was not the question, but I, I would mention this first and then make sure I answer the question. But um, there's a website for uh, the top daily infographic. So it changes the top daily in infographic, um, obviously every day. And so that's a great place to go to get just, what are people looking at? What's an, what's an infographic that might be interesting to use in class as an example? Um, top daily infographic for infographics for memes, um, pop culture wise, um, you know, troll Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, you like your own, your own people, what are your own people sharing, you know, your own people in your own social network, um, and then see, see what is being shared more broadly, what's the like most popular, you know, meme today, you can, you can just kind of Google search too. you can say, um, you can Google top memes of 2021, top memes of 2020. Um, and then you can just get kind of a smattering of what uh, what's out there. But I would say if if one is a social media user oneself, that's where I personally come across most of the memes I come across in my life. And then um, send to Miss Rollins to harass her with. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like we have another question um, from Cheryl. After I create an infographic, is it saved like a Word document so that I can upload to Canvas modules? Cheryl, uh, they are actually not saved as Word documents. You can, it depends on the program too that you're using. So Visme, which we didn't look at, um, but that's another sort of infographic infographic uh, software program, they're all gonna kind of have their own options, but uh, specifically for PictoChart, PictoChart will allow you to save it as an image. And that's how I upload them to Canvas. I download the infographic as, a, as an image. I think it's a JPEG or a PNG, and then I upload that to, as a page in the Canvas module. Um, I tend to also combine it with my if I'm using it for assignment instructions, I'll put the infographic at the top of the instructions and then beneath that, as users scroll down, they'll see the actual complete text with the assignment instructions. 
And you, saving it as an image um, allows users to do that. Uh, they, there is also an option to save as a PDF, but that typically will um, have a cost associated with it, which is why I do an image, because it's free. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, we have a great comment from a student. Thank you, Veronica. One of, I'll, I'll read that comment for us. Um, one of Veronica's favorite professors, I don't want to mispronounce the last name, um, T-W-A-N-A-B-A-S-U used different relatable material during his anatomy lectures. This engaged us more and I truly enjoyed his class because of how relatable it was to us. Thank you so much for sharing that. We love to hear um, student perspectives and that, that using memes, using pop culture, using relatable material, what our students, what people are immersed in in their real lives and bringing that in and relating it to our material. I mean, that's kind of part of our jobs, I think, um, how to show that our material is connected to the world. That's why we do what we do, right? Um, so yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Like free, yeah, who doesn't like free, right? Lots right. of free resources, yay. We teachers, <laughs> we need free. Yes, so try to keep it as low cost and free as possible. I have yet to <laughs> As low, as lowest cost <laughs> as, as free as, as possible. possible. <laughs> absolutely. And free, Wait. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Thank you all so much for the comments and questions. Is there anything else that we can answer as we're kind of preparing to wind down here? All right. Well, we are thankful that you all joined us. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. Thank um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Happy Friday. Happy weekend. Take care, everyone. We have another comment. Teachers in high school who use memes a lot to make the class brighter and easier on the students in general. Love those teachers. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. That really is good to hear. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.